All right, we'll get started. Uh, I am Ashley Davies, Chair of the Master Plan Implementation Committee. This open meeting of the Master Plan Implementation Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of June 16th, 2021, an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. All members of the Master Plan Implementation Committee are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows the Master Plan Implementation Committee to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, unless the chair notes otherwise. Members of the public who wish to view the live stream of this meeting may do so by going to Northborough Remote Meetings on YouTube via the link listed on the agenda. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will not feature public comment. All right, so members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. John Campbell. I'm here. Amy Pretsky. Here. Fran. Here. Rick. I'm here. Dario. Here. Julianne. Here. Jean Cahill. Here. Tracy. Here. Jean Kennedy. Here. And it looks like Bill's just coming on. Bill, you here? I'm here, sorry I'm late. All right, no problem. And staff, when I call your name, please re respond in the affirmative. Uh, Scott, Scott? I'm here. And John? Present. All right. All right, so um, I think we're gonna take things a little out of order from the agenda today, and we're gonna actually start things off with, uh, with the, um, the downtown plan scope of work. Because uh, we have Donnie here from DHB tonight, and we want to let him go if, if we can earlier in the meeting. Um, so I, the draft of the downtown plan scope of work was sent around, as well as some questions and comments, along with the answers that staff and DHB provided. And I just wanted to give people a chance to respond or provide any additional comment. Um, but we, we are hopefully going to vote to approve this tonight. Um, and John, and once we do that, uh, John can kind of give us a sense of um, time frame going forward. So does anybody have any additional comments or questions about the draft scope of work? Well, that's a good sign, I guess. It's a good well, none, uh, Madam Chairman, can I move that the uh, committee accept the uh, draft scope of work as was distributed uh, yesterday by you to the committee? Second it. Is that Fran? Fran seconded? Okay. That's correct. All right. All those in favor? I'll go do roll call. John Campbell? Aye. Amy Presky? Aye. Uh, Dario Damari? Aye. Julianne? Aye. Jean Cahill? Aye. Tracy? Aye. Jean Kennedy? Aye. Bill? Aye. All right, the ayes have it. So scope of work is approved uh, as drafted. And um, John, do you wanna kind of give us a sense of time frame moving forward and- Sure, um, just for the record, that, Madam Chairman, oh, sure. you can call my name, but I also vote aye. Okay, uh, <laughs> sorry, Rick. I didn't call Fran either. And I and I for me too. All right. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the process moving forward, as you as you know, we did put a, a placeholder in the six year capital improvement plan for a master plan implementation committee uh, project, and it was anticipated uh, that it would probably be something to do with the downtown. So it is part of our uh, planning uh, process and our planning tool. And so uh, the next step would be that the, well, internally staff will now take a scope of services, which is one piece of, a, of, a, of an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications. And we will place that into the overall template uh, that we would put out uh, for advertising on the street. 
uh, that also will likely include um, you know, the contextual information, all of the regulatory requirements, as well as a proposed contract so that whoever bids on uh, or is interested in putting a proposal in rather would have all that information. So staff will need some time to, to put that all together. And uh, this would project would get then go to the Financial Planning Committee, which is our Capital Planning Committee, as part of uh, their review of all of the projects of a capital nature that are going to town meeting. Ultimately, the Appropriations Committee also does take a vote on all operating and financial articles, of which this would be one. Uh, so then uh, at that point, uh, we go to town meeting and it's approved, uh, assuming it's approved. The way that we would fund this would be through available funds. So we're not issuing debt as part of a study, so it doesn't need to wait for um, the start of the fiscal year. It doesn't need to wait for you know, a ballot vote or anything like that. So essentially, right after town meeting, we would put this out on the street to advertise, probably let it you know, hang out there, marinate for about four weeks, uh, three to four weeks. Uh, so then you're into, that's in May, and then you would get the proposals, you'd review the proposals, decide if you want to interview uh, the uh, potential consultants, conduct reference checks, contract negotiations, so you're looking in the, the June timeframe. And, uh, and so then we would be starting the actual work at that point. And John, when you say you would review applicants who, who's actually doing that who actually kind of takes a look at the proposals and makes a decision that would be you guys so that's okay. the board of selectmen took the vote to um to delegate the the oversight of the of the process to the to the master plan implementation committee so what we do is we'd package up uh, all the proposals they'd get distributed you'd review them we'd discuss them you'd rank them and then, uh, and then it would be subject to you know, contract negotiations, which is something that I, I would handle. So, would there be any face-to-face -face interviewing with the applicants, either over the Zoom or in person, or anything? Yeah. So, I mean, more than likely, it would probably be well. You could do it. Would probably be over Zoom um, uh, as you're, however, you're conducting your meetings at that time, uh, and you can decide if you wanna, if you want to. Uh, hold interviews. That's one of the things that uh, in terms of the scope of, in terms of the overall RFQ, one of the other items, you know, there's a you know, rule for award, there's a, there's usually a ranking of, you know, uh, advantageous, you know, most advantageous. So this be some criteria upon which, you know, you would rank uh, the proposals. And then, um, and then we'd also include in there whether or not we want to conduct interviews. Generally speaking, what we say is, you know, the the uh, the town reserves the right to conduct interviews with the top with the top two or three candidates. You know, if you only get one proposal that you're really interested in, you know, we can narrow it down quickly. If you get multiple proposals, you may want to may want to talk to multiple consultants. So that's part of the additional uh, information that'll get packaged in around it. John, I have a, just a quick question on that. Is there um, anything in the process where we and it really speaks to what Rick was asking in, in a weird way. Um, the most important thing to me is, is the person they assign to the project, not the company. Because you could have the best company in the world. And if you're, yeah. that's where we need to be interviewing a commitment to here's our project manager, here's gonna be, who's going to be at the weekly meetings. I think that's the most important part, really, which I think goes a little bit to what Rick was saying. If that's yeah. in the project, that's great. Yeah, so in the, in the uh, uh, balance of the information, you know, the scope of services is the meat. This is what you're trying to get. The balance of it is where you explain to them the process, the timeline, the deadlines, how they'll be ranked, whether or not there'll be interviews, and what's standard in an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications process, is they need to tell us who the project team members are, provide their resumes, uh, and those are the folks, if you conduct interviews, that you'll want to be in the interview. Um, that way you're not coming uh, to a meeting and getting the marketing team. You may get somebody from the marketing department, depending on the size of the firm, but you would like to see the actual individuals that will be assigned to your uh, project and be able to ask them questions and you'll have their resumes uh, you know, beforehand as well. I mean, if you go back, a, a good thing, just go back and look at the RFQ that was put together for the master plan itself, you know, similar, similar process and context. Yeah, I just I just don't like the bait and switch. They put everybody out there and you get 
you know, you get stuck with the with the kid out of college. That's all. So we're, we're, we're you've got it all under control. No, this isn't the isn't the first time we've we've done this. So we'll we'll be we'll be looking for the uh, for the exact team members that would be assigned to the project. Uh, like I said, with their resumes, um, and uh, and then uh, we'll go through that that process of of asking questions and interviewing them. So again, if if you go back to look at the master plan process, it's very similar. And anytime we're hiring architects or or consultants, that's that's the that's the process that we use. So that's a balance of the that's a balance of the RFQ that gets put in and around the scope of services that you've approved tonight. And that's what uh, that's what my staff will do. Gene, John, uh, can Donnie's firm, Vanessa Hagen, submit a proposal or are they somehow excluded because they uh, prepared uh, the scope of work? No, they would be eligible. Uh, these aren't proprietary specs in any way. I mean, obviously they have a, an inside line, uh, but uh, but no, we would structure the RF uh, or the RFP to allow them to, to bid. And secondly, uh, in a in obtaining the proposals, can we or do you typically uh, request a, a cost breakdown by task? For example, the six tasks that we have, can we get itemized cost per task as opposed to a lump sum? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, they'll they'll map out. Uh, we ask them to provide a schedule of of. Uh, of the tasks as well as an associated cost, because ultimately that would go into the contract because I'm not gonna pay them one lump sum at the beginning or at the end, they're gonna to wanna to get paid as they go. So the okay. task would be associated with a cost and that would become part of a contract so that as they complete you know, task one, task two, they're gonna to invoice to town and we need to have a very clear document and contract because the town accountant is legally obligated to not release any funds unless unless it complies with the contract. So that would be a typical a typical structure. Yep. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, did anybody else have any more questions before we kind of close this up? Sure, Julianne. Um, okay. So when the RFQ goes out for bid, uh, if anybody knows um, knows a firm that they would like to uh, uh, interview is that proper or is is the bidding process uh, what are there rules to the bidding process uh, there's rules to everything under under mass general law so so what would happen is we would we would get the, you would get the proposals so uh it's it, there's nothing wrong with like if, if if anybody here is aware of a of a firm that you're interested in like if vhb weren't at the table i would probably uh prospectively send it to them um because they worked on our master plan <laughs> Um, so we can, there's nothing that precludes us from sending it out to firms that may or, not, may, or may not be interested. But the reality is it'll, it'll, it'll be advertised through the central register through uh, various means that they're all watching. And they're all, this is how everything is required to be um, advertised in the state procurement. So the firms will be watching anyway, but if, if someone has a firm specifically that they're interested in, you know, we can, we can prospectively send it to them. Um, but what happens is once the proposals come in, we'll sort them out, we'll distribute them, and then this committee will discuss them in the public meeting in accordance with the criteria contained in the, in the RFQ and essentially rank them. And then after you rank them, you can determine whether or not uh, you would like to proceed with in-person interviews and how many firms you would like to interview. And then ultimately, the, the group will have to vote, to, will rank and vote on their top choice and then recommend that firm to me for contract negotiations. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, well, if there are no further questions, I think probably, Donnie, you don't have to stick around. We're going to just go into some project updates, but I appreciate you coming today just in case. Um, and thank you for drafting this scope of work. Yeah, no problem. An easy night for me. So yeah. um, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Um, <laughs> take care, folks. Bye-bye. You too. Thanks, Tony. Um, so since we're already out of order, I was thinking at this point, we can kind of get into some project updates. And uh, I just wanted to make clear, there's been some discussion at various boards and committees about 
going to get master plan implementation committee approval before moving forward on things. Um, but really, you know, we're here to try to get projects moving forward, but we're not an oversight committee for other boards. So throughout the master plan, it says who is the lead and, and whoever is shown as the lead on that particular project, that's who is in charge of that project. Um, we don't have oversight over that. But, you know, that being said, I did want to give some updates on some things that are happening throughout town um, and various boards and committees that relate to the master plan. Um, and if folks have, you know, comments or suggestions, you know, you can direct them to those, those committees or boards. Um, so the first thing was just that the Bartlett Street um, Road Safety Audit has been completed. And I think Scott is going to be putting that up on the traffic safety webpage. Um, and basically, it, it just showed that speeding was not an issue on the roadway, that recent mitigation efforts improved conditions, um, and the DPW is going to review um, suggestions for possible implementation um, for any improvements that were suggested within the the plan and um, the post occupancy study is nearly complete, and I'm sure that'll be going around um, once it's done. But it, Ashley, it shows, if I could just yeah. interrupt you, so the post occupancy sure. is done and it's up oh, it on the done. town's website oh, and great. the CMRPC's website as well as the road safety audit. So the full okay. documents are up uh, on the website now. If anybody would like to check those out, perfect. Both, uh, <clears throat> both documents are on the DPW Transportation Safety. Uh, web page under board communications. If you go okay. to the bottom, they're under attachments. Um, they're both completed and um, publicized on our website as well as uh, CMRPCs as John indicated. Great. And the reason I bring those up is just their relation to um, goal T2-1 and the master plan. And so that's really the extent of that. So if anybody wants to take a look at those, those are up as Scott said on the website. Um, the next project update was the, the planning board has a few uh, bylaws they're going to be bringing to annual town meeting. One is a sign bylaw. Um, this relates to the master plan and that um, uh, goal ED1-3 talks about creating a cohesive um, design uh, and identity for the downtown area, including uh, signage. Um, so this, I think this, the planning board sign bylaw is um, in relation to the, the entire town, I believe. Um, but it will uh, also affect the downtown. And just to say that they will have a uh, public meeting for comment on March 15th. So if you have any comments, um, you can bring them to that meeting. Um, but also if in our uh, work on the downtown master plan, we come up with any uh, goals or suggestions relating to signage and in the downtown, um, you know, there's always opportunity for adjusting bylaws in the future. So I think, you know, it, it'd be nice for everything in town to be done at once, and um, but we don't want to be holding up progress on projects throughout town um, just because the downtown plan is coming. So I think, you know, there'll be opportunity for adjustments and improvements if need be in the future if they come out of the downtown master plan. Um, and then design review. I think, Dario, you were going to speak a little bit to this. Um, there is a goal in the master plan about periodic review of existing design guidelines um, to ensure balance between community character and new development and redevelopment. Um, uh, so I think you know this relates to that. So design review committee um, has come up with some new design guidelines for duplexes, I believe. Dario. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there were it, when we were looking at the guidelines. It was more a question, uh, I think um, Bob brought it up on the right hand and the left hand on what they're doing is all it was about. <clears throat> and when we're looking at the duplexes, um, one of the questions came up about sidewalks or street trees or all these things that we're sitting here talking about with the master plan. So I went through our goals and, and um, to your point, Ashley, the, the LU3-1 you read was a goal, then H24 was zoning guidelines, and we had a housing goal, uh, but also um, more hands-on that I think affect us doing the, with the DRC, um, promote tree planting, create walkable paths and connections, 
Um, and, and, and that was LU25. I don't give the numbers, but access to trails, access to the riverfront, um, enhanced walkability, improved walkability under um, the transportation. So, so there was a whole bunch of stuff there and I'm thinking, geez, how do we pull these together? What do we do? And I just want right hand, left hand to know what's going on. So if, if we're doing something with the, with the DRC, um, hopefully it ties into what we're doing here. So if there's something we can do, if the next duplex goes up and we'd say, gee, it'd be nice to have a sidewalk um, and a couple trees. And then as things get built, maybe someday we have the sidewalks we want. I don't know anything about our process and how that gets enforced, put in, you know, but I think when we're doing this, we certainly should be in sync because it's interesting that I'm on both committees because I can hear from both sides and if we're all just doing the same thing and there's an opportunity to start getting it done, not necessarily seeking permission, but just, yeah, maybe we have to, I don't know. But so that's where we were and yeah. it just seemed like, <laughs> wow, if we're doing this, why not do stuff that we want to do at the Master Plan Implementation Committee? If it's doable, and then at that point, um, I hold up the white flag because I don't know all the processes and protocols in, in in doing that. You know, can we ask them to put a five foot sidewalk in two trees or a tree for every 150 feet or anything as as a requirement or suggestion? That's it. Mayor, yeah. Yeah, obviously, I think that that probably sounds like a discussion with Scott and the Complete Streets program, right? I don't know. Um, but that's, I mean, it sounds in line with what we're hoping to accomplish. And duplexes aren't just downtown, they're everywhere, right? But um, but I'm sure that'll kind of some information on that will come out in the downtown master plan. But um, that sounds like a, a Complete Streets question, too. So, uh, uh, Madam Chair, so the, the complete streets process, we've um, we had the policy adopted by the Board of Selectmen. We've submitted a grant application to uh, MassDOT to aid our funding for the development of the prioritization plan, um, which Dario will uh, uh, identify gaps in our sidewalk network. Um, so I think, you know, when that prioritization plan is, is developed and adopted is an appropriate time for uh, the DRC to uh, see where connectivity issues exist and not um, just have a kind of a, a blanket, put a sidewalk in front of your duplex or put a sidewalk in front of your development because you end up with sidewalks that go nowhere and start nowhere. Um, so it's, it's the, the connectivity is important. If there's an opportunity to, you know, foster that connectivity with, with private development and municipal develop, uh, municipal improvements thereafter, it would be fantastic. Um, it's just, you know, we're, like we always say, it's a work in progress. Um, we're hoping uh, DOT f helps fund our prioritization plan. And, um, you know, once it's, once it's approved, it's shared with, with the boards and committees and, and um, then it's all hands on deck. Just if I may yes. just add Scott. So Scott has put that, that grant application in and, and uh, we received a very, very positive uh, feedback from his application. So we're cautiously optimistic that that would be will be funded, so that's going to be a great start. Right. It sounds like that would be a good tie-in for the if that design review guidelines tie into the complete streets and the the connect connectivity issues. Sounds great. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Dario. Um, yeah, just right hand, left hand. That's just what yeah. we should. Oh, that's great. Um, so that was it for the, the project updates. I don't know if anybody had any questions um, before we move on. There's not much left in the agenda. Um, so I wanted to make sure people had time to, to chat. I'm going to go through the uh, affordable housing thing, Ashley. Oh, yeah, Rick. Sorry. Why is that not on my list? It must have been. We have to go through the minutes as well. Yes. Yes. And I have one other item on the agenda as well. But yeah, Rick, please. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring the committee up to speed on a on a, a project that the uh, Northboro Affordable Housing Corporation partnered with the Northboro Housing Authority on to present to the uh, CPC for funding at this year's town meeting that really fits a couple of the uh, master plan recommendations pretty closely. H11 
talks about exploring residential uses, including affordable housing and affordable senior housing as a potential future use for previously developed parcels. And H13 that talks about working with local housing partners to identify opportunities for them to develop and own affordable housing, allowing the town to proactively guide affordable housing locations. So basically, the housing authority uh, has a, a development of senior uh, affordable housing one bedroom units at their colonial village site off of Summer Street. It backs up to the uh, back of the library parking lot, if you're familiar with that area of town. And they've had an open parcel of land. They've got, I um, can't remember the exact count, six or seven buildings of, of one bedroom apartments there now. But they've had an open parcel of land that the, um, the Northboro Affordable Housing Corporation has been working with the Housing Authority to see if there's some potential to develop another building and add some additional units. The Housing Authority uh, works off a uh, statewide uh, list of people waiting for this kind of housing, which typically has more than a thousand people on it at any time. And uh, there was never a good opportunity to find a way to, to effectively finance building another building on that lot. But uh, the beginning of this year, really the, the end of last year, I guess I'm in 2022 now. So at the end of 2020, the State Department of Housing Community Development, the HCD, informed local housing authorities that they had a fund of money available to help offset the cost of creating just this kind of housing, um, one bedroom apartments for low income seniors. And they would, they would, uh, apply a certain amount of money for every unit. And if they were handicapped accessible units, an additional $50,000 per unit on top of the amount that they would uh, fund for each unit. But they would want a partnership with other funding sources to make the project a reality. Once we saw that, we got very interested in this particular project. Another state agency provided some funding to do a feasibility study on that lot to see if it would be developable, which it was. At that point, um, the Housing Authority hired an architect to do a conceptual design and a cost estimate of the uh, project. And the net of it is that between the money that the state would provide per unit, we could do a two-story building with eight units. The bottom four would be handicapped accessible. The top four would not be because there'd be no elevator in the building. Um, between the state contribution, the housing authority had some reserve money they could put towards it. And we went to the CTC to ask them to fund the balance through community preservation money, which they've agreed to do. So there's gonna be a Warren article coming up at town meeting this year, uh, basically explaining this um, and asking for town approval for this Warren article to fund um, the balance of this project. So we think it's a, it's a really nice project. Like I said, there's a significant waiting list um, they have, they are very few handicapped accessible units currently in these housing authority developments. And the director, Lynn Trombley, told us that she could basically, if we had this building built, she could take at least four elderly people who need a handicapped accessible units out of the units they're in and move them in and then take the four new units and the four available units and put eight other people on the waiting list into these units. So it's a great project. And uh, the CPC has given their approval to putting it on the warrant. So it'll go to town meeting in April and hopefully the town will approve it. In the meantime, uh, the housing authority is working with DHCD to try and secure the state portion of the funding. So it's a cool project and it really fits uh, two of the major goals within the uh, master plan. Great, and, and I have updated all of these projects on the um the spreadsheet that we're the tracking spreadsheet and I can send around an updated uh, version of that. I think we still don't have a place, a central place on the town website or anywhere to kind of share that, right, John? Um, so I'll uh, just- No, add. not if it's uh, something that you want the uh, members to be able to edit. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So I'll, I'll send around an updated version after the meeting um, so everyone can just kind of keep track of where we're at. Um, but that's it. That's that. Those are the project updates. Just kind of keeping track of things we haven't heard about yet that uh, tie into the master plan. Um, so uh, I don't know. We'll give a chance for anybody who has questions or comments. And um, before we move on to the next agenda item, John, just to comment. Now that we've approved 
what is our priority project. We've approved a scope of work and that will take some time to come through. Um, are there actions that we'll work on as a committee that you know we can move forward uh, on our own uh, or take actions on our own or prod another committee or board to take that action as opposed to you know needing uh, outside study for same? Yeah, I mean, in the meantime, while we're waiting for the downtown plan to start, maybe next time we meet, we can kind of review um, the other priorities and what we can do in terms of next steps on moving those forward. I think that would be a good good thing to do. So, yeah. One thing I could suggest that we could think about, you know, we changed the scope of work for the downtown to really put the onus on the consultant to help us figure out what we want the boundaries of the downtown to be. Probably wouldn't be a bad idea, though, before the consultant comes in and has this kickoff meeting, if we had some sort of feeling among ourselves generally about what we thought was reasonable and not reasonable. So it might not be a bad idea at an upcoming meeting, to maybe just schedule a general discussion and get some ideas and input from people around the committee as to what people think, you know, reasonably we're talking about for a boundary here. I don't think it's anything we have to make a decision on. Once again, we're going to want the consultant to help us, but it'd be useful at the very beginning to at least have some idea of at least what we're thinking about, you know, kind of thing. So maybe that's something we could think about having an agenda item sometime between now and the time the consultant is hired. Yeah, I see no problem with that. I mean, it's nothing final and official. It's just a sketch um, that could help get things started quicker. So that makes sense to me. Sorry. I like your assistant. <laughs> <laughs> she taking minutes for us? Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> it's beautiful. Rick, I have a question. Sure. Um, just about uh, the senior housing project. I recently have um, just heard this, I don't know that much more about it, and I don't know if there'd be state funding or other programs that could help support it, but um, building to net zero standards in terms of energy use would be so beneficial for low income people because it reduces the operational costs um, associated with, and I don't know if that's even built into, you know, how that's built into the public housing. But um, apparently, you know, from what I understand, it's only like a one to 3% higher initial cost to build to a much higher efficiency standard. And I'm just wondering if there's any place in the process of, um, of planning this public housing uh, to, for us to perhaps, you know, do some research around that and um, see what's possible. I'll, I'll bring that up with uh, Lynn Trombley, the Housing Authority Director. I know that any new construction they're trying to do in the state is trying to meet those kinds of guidelines. I also realize that the tenants don't pay utilities in any of this housing. And so it's to the benefit of the state and the housing authority to keep those kinds of costs down as much as possible. So they're incented to do things like that. But I don't know if particularly when the bid goes out for a contractor to do this project, how much it will specify that kind of information, but I'll check with Lynn and see what they typically do. And I can comment a little bit on that because we do have towns now that are asking us to do net zero. And um, in most cases, it actually costs more for the utilities because they often mandate all electric, which isn't necessarily as cost economical, it's greener, but not necessarily the lowest price. Yes, you have more insulation and all green materials, which we're doing. Um, and, and it depends where you are, your availability utilities, the cost of utilities um, on the Delta in the cost. And, and we're doing a really large building now uh, in Wellesley um, for, for Dana Hall and it's, you know, it's 25, $30 million, but we're doing as much as we can to be green and, and Wellesley has its own utility company. So that gets, it gets a little bit confusing, but the, the goal is awesome. Um, and we try to meet or exceed that wherever we can. Um, and some of it can be more efficient if you have subsidies, um, not necessarily if it's just dollar for dollar, you know, it's no different than the solar 
panels without the government input. They don't pay for themselves. Um, but when you have a lot of money coming in from different funds, then they can be more economical. So it's it's very dependent on where you are um, and what utilities are available to see. And I don't know, honestly, anything about where we are with Northboro with, with the whole net zero, but it's 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 coming um, and we're trying to be ahead of the curve with it. Um, so if there's some talk on it, I could certainly help a little bit with that because it's not our first time <laughs> trying to do that. Okay. All right. Um, well, if there aren't any more questions or comments, oh, it looks like Jean Kennedy. Yep. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I'm having trouble with uh, the computer. Uh, to go back to Rick's uh, thoughts about uh, project study area, it might be a useful exercise for the group as we did with uh, sort of screening the various recommendations to perhaps circulate individually base map of downtown and everybody sort of draw what they think their project study area should be and then use that sort of as a starting point for our uh, discussions about the project area boundaries. It's a good idea. Yeah, I like that idea. I'm thinking of how we would do that on Zoom, but I give that some thought if everyone came prepared with a, a drawing to find a way to share it around. Well, we could at least each use the base map to sort of get our own idea and just verbally express what it is we sort of draw the line around. Our um, town website has a relatively robust uh, GIS component to it. Um, so there's an opportunity to, you know, zoom out and, and sketch out some, some polylines around an area or just, just, you know, uh, polygons um, and then just print a PDF and, send it to one, one, one member to kind of compile into a slide with names. It's just a suggestion. Yeah, that works. All right. Well, I'll plan to have that on the next meeting and maybe we'll have some homework ahead of time to kind of all work on that. Um, all right, before we move on to review and approve minutes, I just wanted to mention an opportunity which um, the planning board had, um, or I think Julianne, somebody brought to my attention that um, the planning board has about 24 hours currently available to them um, for consult with CMRPC, which is a Central Mass Regional Planning uh, Council. And um, I was thinking we could ask the planning board and I would, draft a letter uh, to the planning board to request an hour meeting with a CMRPC um, consultant just to kind of, you know, pick their brain, get another um, set of ideas about the whole downtown process and kind of where we're moving with things um, just for some additional information and kind of to bounce ideas off. And um, so I think that'll be a good thing to do. And in advance of that, um, you know, if anybody had any particular burning questions um, that they wanted me to bring up at that meeting, I could do that. And so um, just feel free to email me if you had any questions that you'd like, you know, answered or things you'd want discussed. Um, happy to, to take those comments and questions. Ashley might see MR. PC be an applicant on the downtown study? It's possible. Um, I, I mean, I don't know, John, have they applied for things in the past? Um, no, I, I would think that we're probably looking at more, um, more consulting groups um, than the CMRPC uh, of coming in on this, but um, yeah, I, I would be I would, would be surprised that 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 would be somewhat out of out of uh, out of practice or character for that. Yeah, is there an exposure if we do this, and then for somehow they decide they want to get involved, and now we're at risk of somehow giving them inside information or something? 
No, I mean, I mean, everything is public, you know, um, it's no more insider information than uh, VHB has having been involved in our master plan process. So, yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah, Amy? I, don't, I, don't, I don't see them doing that. They're actually really short staffed right now. And I wouldn't foresee them bidding out on anything with another town. Like you could go to them with your hours and, and get help, but I, I'm just, I wouldn't foresee them ever bidding out to do a big job like this. I mean, honestly, how they, how they would be used is if we didn't have a VHB at the table, uh, we would probably go to them and say, can you come and use some of those hours to help us develop a scope of services or review a scope of service. And, and, and they're more of a, they're more of a ongoing consultation, you know, arm for us than, uh, than a, a bidder on a, on a project. Yeah. So like I said, feel free to send me an email if you have any questions or, or um, topics you want discussed. Um, but moving on, uh, I think the last item that we just have to do is uh, review and approve January minutes. Um, so I don't know if anybody had any edits or changes um, suggested on those minutes. John? I have a very tiny um, typo, page three. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh paragraph starts off Mr. Kader. And the second full sentence says, he said that this committee has made great process. And I believe it's supposed to be progress. We made great progress through great process. <laughs> Works for me either way. I'm just I'm fulfilling the Leslie Harrison role. <laughs> If uh, just for future reference, if, if anybody reviews the minutes and there's a non-substantive typo or something like that, if you just let uh, Michelle know, uh, we can make that minor change and redistribute them for, you know, before the meeting. So we don't, you know, take up time over minor things that aren't substantive. Okay, uh, Julianne. Um, I'm not sure what page it's on, but the paragraph that begins Ms. Backstrom, um, it said Ms. Backstrom felt it was not a good idea to a new committee. We have to add the word add. And also in that same paragraph, uh, Ms. Ms. Davies or Mr. Leaf could, could attend any one of these on this committee's behalf and bring it back so they are kept updated. She did not want them to don't forget. I, I don't think we want that word don't in there. She did not want them to forget there are 500 additional pages, right? Is Fran yeah. there? Is that what yep. you meant? <laughs> yes. Great, great. Um, we'll make those edits. We'll have Michelle make those edits. Um, Ashley yeah. Blairs. Sorry. Oh, Jean. Do. Yes. Um, on that same page, uh, Ms. Hirsch thought Mr. Kennedy had a great point and thought it could be solved with the stakeholder interviews. She asked when the consultant does these interviews, can any of them be involved in those? And I think we're missing something um, that Julianne, perhaps you can fill in there, but I think what was implied was that what, what could a member of the committee attend those meetings? Is that correct, Julianne? Yes, yes, and I was gonna actually, I was wondering about asking for that too. Yes. If, if any of the members of the committee to substitute that phrase for them, take out them and. And then one other thing uh, in uh, the next, the uh, paragraph beginning, Ms. Davies asked if there will be an opportunity for these groups to attend their meetings. And I'm not sure what that refers to, which groups, um, whether again, that refers to the stakeholders or committee members? Good question. I'll look back at that and I'll make I'll make an edit uh, depending on what I, I meant by that. And one other picky detail <laughs> on the next page, Mr. Coderre said, uh, first paragraph, um, just the word confer in the second to last sentence, he did not think it was necessary to pass a motion that says something that we just need to confer. I, I didn't, I don't know if that means concur or confirm. I think it's just concur. Concur. Yeah. 
I, I think the, what I said was uh, if it's agreeable by consensus. So I don't have the minutes in front of me. It's all on video anyway, so. I don't know why, we, I don't know why the state requires us to produce minutes at this point. It's sort of ridiculous. Everything's being videotaped, but. We'll make those edits. All right. Any others? And I move that we accept the minutes as amended. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? John Campbell? Aye. Amy? Aye. Rick? Aye. Dario? Aye. Julianne? Aye. Jean Cahill? Aye. Tracy? Aye. Jean Kennedy? Aye. Fran? Aye. Bill? Adrian? Don't hear her, but I know she's there. Millie? Aye. All right. I have it. Minutes are approved. And that's it. <laughs> we have nothing else on the agenda. That was a quick meeting tonight, guys. Um, so unless there's anything else that anyone wants to discuss, Julianne? Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's just I was thinking about Dario's line of thinking and the, you know, the left hand being in sync with the right hand. And um, so, you know, Complete Streets is gonna be a big part of, of our downtown development and our whole master plan. And the other day I was listening in on a um, urban street symposium. And, you know, there is, so it was, it was talking about the health of trees that are built along streets and whatnot. And it occurred to me, um, using Dario's line of thinking that as we build and repair sidewalks, at the same time, can we be considering tree placement and tree health? And how, like, is that just a given or do we have to have, you know, a separate allotment of money for that? How does that work? Um, through the chair. One of the uh, um, changes that, that New England is going toward with um, street trees is to move street trees from the grass strip between the sidewalk and the roadway to behind the sidewalk. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. One is tree health. Um, that's a relatively hazardous location for trees when it comes to compaction of soils, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 water uh, infiltration, as well as salt and chemicals. Um, one of the goals and objectives uh, is to get it behind the sidewalk. Um, Cambridge is doing that all over the place. Uh, that's, that's one of their standards. They have a lot of very old growth trees in, the, um, in tree wells between the sidewalk and the roadway. The sidewalks are heaved, they're not accessible, the curbs are moving. Um, it's problematic. So from a design uh, review perspective, um, that's one of those things to consider when there's adequate right away or uh, concurrence from the abutter having street trees placed behind the sidewalk um, is the preferred approach when you look at the downtown um, if the downtown ends up being the route 20 corridor that's mass dot um, mass dot in my experience is not a gigantic fan of of tree wells along their state routes um, it's problematic for, for many reasons that I just described. Um, so, you know, we have sort of different corridors in, in, in different locations. And I think that's, that's part of the discussion when it comes to complete streets, um, revegetating out of urban forest, as well as the design review kind of review standards. Um, you know, I'm the tree warden in town. I assess all of the uh, public shade trees, which is any tree that's located within the public right of way um outside of the state highways and you know my preference is that you know the trees are set behind the sidewalk where the sidewalk is maintained safe and when a tree is there um, it tends to be healthier um, it's outside of the overhead power line location it's generally away from drip lines on on uh, 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 private properties and it's, it's it's just a safer location for for vehicles
Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Sorry if that was a long answer, but. It, well, can I ask you another question as long as we're lucky enough to have you there? They were talking about something about something about pervious asphalt. Is this like a commonly used thing now or some new technology that people are just trying? Do you? Do you it's uh, for a while, but. Uh, I'm sorry, Dario. You can. Yeah, I, it's, it's out there, uh, Julian, but. For all practical reasons, it's a joke because it, in about a year it fills up, and then you're sitting. Uh, it's it's insanity. It's a great thing to get past the codes, but it takes about a year for. All, imagine putting your carpet out there. You know the water passes right through it, and then you get wind, dust, pollen, and in three months it's not pervious anymore, and you're forced to quote unquote maintain it, vacuum it, scrub it. <clears throat> we put it in. Um, and we've taken it out. Um, there's a lot of other surfaces that you can use that will absorb water, but pervious concrete, this is just my experience and opinion, is is brutal. It's a wonderful thought, but it really doesn't work um, unless it's meticulous maintenance. Yeah, creating rain gardens, things of that nature are a much better approach. I would not recommend the impervious at all. It's a maintenance nightmare. One of the challenges with um, um, pervious pavement that Dario just indicated is the uh, operations maintenance component that's required under the uh, stormwater management bylaws and um, uh, DEP's regulations that you have to vacuum it. Uh, on top of that, we're in a, a freeze thaw cycle in New England. So uh -huh. this is wonderful. Water gets into the pavement and then it freezes and it breaks the pavement up. Um, from a civil engineering perspective, you want to keep water out of your sub base under pavements at all costs. Um, so there's because of the freeze thaw cycle. So in this region, it's really not a viable alternative unless it's somebody's patio in their backyard. Yeah, it's like a wet paint sign, right? You put up the wet paint sign and everybody's going to touch it. You just, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's really bad. It's a great idea, but I, I promise you it doesn't work. And, and maybe to Scott's point, if you're maintaining it on your own and you don't mind it once a year, and it's not just a vacuum, it's a power wash and vacuum because you got to get everything up. And it's just, it's brutal. It's, it's, and, you know, I thought it was the best thing since sliced bread until we put it in three or four times. <laughs> uh, not then, not to mention. <laughs> Not to mention, you know, you don't want somebody having a, an oil spill or any freeze leak because uh, you're not going to clean it up. It's going to go straight down into the ground. So. Exactly. Which means you're going to be digging it all up anyway. So, yeah, it's it's uh, it was a good concept. Well, I'm you know, in in 25 years, hopefully they'll perfect it. But OK, <laughs> not tomorrow. <okay. laughs> Thank you. Well, those were certainly interesting questions and good things to know as we move forward. <laughs> so thank, thank you for uh, asking. Thanks, Scott and Dario, for answering. Um, all right. Well, if, there's, if there aren't any other questions or topics, um, can we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, John Campbell? Amy? Aye. Rick? Aye. Dario? Aye. Julianne? Aye. Jean Cahill? Aye. Tracy? Aye. Jean Kennedy? Aye. Graham? Aye. Bill? Aye. Millie? Aye. Adrian? No, I still can't hear Adrian, but hopefully she can hear us. All right, well, we're adjourned. So thank you all very much for a quick meeting and excited to get going on the scope of work. So thank you, everybody. All right, Thanks, we'll Catherine. see you all in, in March.